my actions started the cycle of violence. He took the love and what my life could have been like. I want him to look me in the face and tell me why he killed my mother. There's no way that you could actually prepare for something like this. This is the last piece of that puzzle from a lifetime of what if. I've spent half my life working with the criminal justice system, and I've seen lives devastated by violence. We like to imagine that after the verdict, the story is over. The victim and the offender are never meant to meet again. But for some, the only way to move forward is to come face to face with the person who shattered their lives. So I'm here in Los Angeles to meet with Mariah Lucas. She's 25 years old, she's got uh, three kids, but she actually lost her own mother uh, when she was just a toddler. When you lose a, a parent at a young age, you're really just forced to piece together the memories based on you know, stories or photographs or even just your own imagination. So she's planning on meeting with the man who actually took her mother's life. And I want to talk with her about what she hopes to get out of the whole conversation. You're a little girl, you lose your mom. It takes a lot to get to where you are, doesn't it? Tell me more about that. I see the world as a very beautiful, colorful place and I choose to be a positive person. Where does that come from given that you did not exactly ha have a colorful, happy place <laughs> upbringing. Um, honestly, I think it comes from knowing how bad it can be. Dylan's gonna pray. Say it out loud, buddy, so I can hear. Heavenly God, oh, thank you for this day. We think about Jesus, still God. Bless the food, hope that Jesus is okay. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 <laughs> Great job, Nolan. He says the cutest yeah. prayers every time. I try to raise my kids the way that I wanted to be raised. I try to treat my children the way that I wanted to be treated growing up. Cuddling and holding hands and hugging them and kissing them and taking pictures. You got me. I got you. I struggle. With, am I doing this right? Am I being a good mom? Do my kids look at me and feel good about the life that they're living? Okay, ready? Down. Oh. Okay. Do you want pink fork or do you want silver? Wait. Do you want me to cut them or you got it? I have no memory of my mother at all. The only thing that I know about her is the pictures and the stories that my family has given me. I was born in San Bernardino, California to my mom, Charlene Heinemann, and my dad, and I had an older brother. You know, we were, from what I could tell, happy for a while, and then my mom was killed when I was 15 months old. The only thing I knew about my mom's murder was that it was on my brother's fifth birthday, April 20th, 1993. My mom went to the ATM to get out money for my brother for his birthday. My family was at Chuck E. Cheese and they were all waiting for my mom and she never showed up. The only information that I ever got about my mom's murder was that her throat had been slit and that she was shoved back into her car and her laundry was tossed on top of her. When my mother died, that led my dad down a really dark path. When I was seven years old, uh, just before Christmas, my father came home to his girlfriend in bed with another man. And it was like the gates of hell had opened up and they both continued to fight and hit each other. The police took both my father and the man that he was fighting and 
One had a screwdriver stuck in his mouth and the other was barely conscious to make it out of the driveway. That was when my uncle came and picked up my brother and I. My father was in and out of prisons and jails. My main focus was surviving. Um, so in your heart you have contention. Going through my childhood and experiencing some of the things that I experienced, it does take a lot out of you. Um, I, you know, contemplated suicide, I contemplated running away as a little girl. I thought that running away from my problems was going to fix it. But honestly, it was finding somebody in this world that truly cared about me, finding that unconditional love and support that I found in the man I now call my husband. We got married uh, March 29th, 2012, and life was great. I love you very much. Love you too. And then I got really sick. I became septic after a wisdom teeth removal, and I spent a week in the hospital um, on life support. Having grown up without a mother and without a stable family, all I wanted to give my kids was a mother and a father to live with, to have experiences with. So I asked my husband, please pray over me. Please make sure that I come out of this. After I got home from the hospital and I started getting back into my normal daily routine, I knew that there was something else missing from my life. If I had questions about my mom's murder, I needed to reach out to this man who killed my mother 23 years ago. You wrote him a letter. It's like five pages long. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. I wanted him to know who I was and to, to know the life that I've lived because of what he did. How would your brother feel about you reaching out to the person who uh, took the life of your mother? I think that he will be very mad at me. Um, much of his childhood, he grew up hating and resenting his birthday. You're risking your own emotions. You're risking your relationship with your family. What is it that you want to know? Why was taking her life necessary? And as a mom now, the last thing that would go through my mind before I died would be, I hope my kids know that I love them. And that has been in my mind since I was a little girl. You know, what was the last thing that my mother said? I am meeting the man who killed my mother, looking into the face that my mother saw last. My name is Jason Clark. I did just over 23 years in prison for second degree murder on a sentence of 15 to life. And I paroled on election day, 2016. Uh, so big day that's going to happen soon. And I just wanted to kind of talk with you about it. You kind of had a tough upbringing, right? But we were both uh, Star Wars geeks right, right. as kids a little and bit yeah a little bit so how do you go from being this this kid looking at star wars like millions of others to uh, being in, in in prison i was uh born in oklahoma but uh shortly after that my mother moved out to california my understanding was she moved back to california to return home to her parents which she wasn't allowed to return home with me, and so she left me in a motel room when I was around six months old, and that's when I went into the foster care system. It was different families, no, no stability. It was, it was just bits and pieces of different families. And when I was 16, I went and lived on the streets. The drug use became really rampant. And when the meth use started, that's when things really started to go downhill. I'm not going to say downward spiral. It was a nosedive. I would hitchhike everywhere, meet older gentlemen, 
Uh, and the trade-off with them was drugs and motel rooms and, and money for sex. If there was something to be stolen, I stole it. I was doing anything to get high, and anything I was doing, I would have to cover it up and suppress it with being high. And so it was just an uh, ongoing cycle. I had been at a guy's house, and uh, it, I was staying in his garage for a couple days. Tweaking is what we were doing. And uh, I had left that night to go out and see what was going on. And I was at a point in my life where I was angry and pissed off about a lot of things. I hated myself. I hated everybody around me. I was uh, a really a, a miserable person at that point. <sighs> and uh, I crossed the railroad tracks and, and on one of the side streets, Charlie, she had parked her car. I knew Charlene Heineman. I actually went to junior high with her, her uh, brother for a little bit. I had seen her more and more because we were in the same neighborhood and running in similar circles. Um, I was pissed, and uh, I, I went over and banged on, banged on the window. Belligerent, loud, aggressive, this little bit of anger uh, sparked up, and I just fed it. I, I had reached down and, and grabbed my knife, and uh, she collapsed almost instantly after that. The next thought was, I have to get out of here, and ran away off through the orange groves. I was really on the down low for a couple months until I uh, was finally arrested. And I was 21 when I got to prison and understood before I went in there that I needed to make a name for myself. Because there's really two categories of people. The guys that are victimizing people and the guys that are being victimized. After a couple years in prison, there was a guy there. He, we found out that he was in there for child molestation, which in prison politics, that's a, a green light on him. And so I volunteered, and me and another young guy uh, went into his cell, and we beat him half to death. After that, I actually got rolled up and put in a hole. I finally came to a point in there I'm literally in my cell licking my wounds. And uh, it came to me that if I kept going the way I was going, I was going to die in prison. So you're, you're sitting there, you're in a secured housing unit. You're isolated from everybody. You're in a prison inside a prison. But something positive starts to happen. I found a self-help book, Bolo's Off, We're All Doing Time. Here's a book that said, how do we expect to solve our problems with the same thinking that caused our problems? I'm not the only one that's had a tough upbringing, and people have been successful and phenomenal their whole lives, even with that. I allowed myself to use that as an excuse to isolate myself and become distant from everybody. When I started looking for help, and I started seeing the psychologist at the prison, uh, that's when the biggest change came. She had me do a writing exercise. And I, what I ended up doing was I was writing my life story. Once I started writing, I could not stop. And that was the very beginning of it. I was finally found suitable for parole on my fourth parole hearing. And I, I couldn't breathe, but it took me two or three hours before my chest was no longer tight and I could finally breathe a little bit and, and come back down to earth. And um, five weeks later on, I had got back to my room, my cell, uh, from work one night. And my celly at the time had told me, hey, you got some mail, it's on your bunk. And climbed up on my bunk, uh, picked up this letter and looked at it. And I didn't recognize the name, the address, anything. So I go ahead and open it and I start reading it. About a paragraph into the letter, I realized that this is from Charlene's daughter. 
And my first thought was, here comes the hate mail. Um, and the reality is that I was more prepared to deal with the hate mail than I was what was in that letter. Jason Wayne Clark. Your name has been in my mind for the last 20 or so years. I have thought about you nearly every week of my life, and I have many questions for you. I finally decided to reach out. I'd had hopes you would be willing to meet me. My name is Mariah Lucas, the daughter of Charlene Heidemann, the woman you killed. After the first paragraph, I had to put it down. It was like a slug to the chest. I had to put it down. I couldn't believe what I was holding in my hand. Uh, 23 years of no contact from anybody. I realize that my contacting you may come as a surprise. I want to tell you a little about myself and the life that I have lived. She told me about her life and the things that she had been through. It's what we call the cycle of violence. I went through a cycle of violence and my actions started another cycle of violence that she had to live through. And she was the one that broke that cycle of violence. I would like to ask that you would allow me to come visit you. At the end of that letter, she had told me to forgive myself. And uh, that hit me harder than anything else. Um, it was, it was unreal. like such a sweetheart a lot of times sweet people all of a sudden they just flash and it turns out you know I mean are you prepared for that I mean what if, what if she just goes off she is entitled to that 100% mm. absolutely I'm at the point where I feel this needs to be done regardless of the outcome but what do you think she's gonna get out of this I knew that he had answers to my life that nobody else did the selfish part of me wants to say I do want him to see me as a piece of my mother. I do want him to see this woman that resembles, you know, the life that he'd taken away. This is the last piece of that puzzle that I need to really completely heal from a lifetime of what if. Grab a seat, man. Thank you. So you are the person who is most responsible for getting these two folks together. Right. So I had, I've uh, met with Jason and Mariah in person, maybe three, four times, and then other times over the phone. More time with Jason than, than, than Mariah and preparing him for what's going to be a very, very difficult time of answering questions. He, he's putting himself at some real risk. He's got to deal with both having a conversation with this person who, you know, he killed her mother and coming out of prison. Typically, these victim offender dialogues happen with the person still serving their time in prison. When I met Jason, a lot of our conversation was just uh, confirming that he was at a place that was right for him to participate in the victim offender dialogue. You're going to be in a situation where uh, those two people are sitting knee to knee. Uh, you'll be uh, off camera, present. Do you have concerns about uh, that kind of situation with two people, with these kind of potential feelings and there, emotions? There's, there's always a concern. You know, we're human beings and uh, we don't know how, we, we can't predict how people are going to act. I think it's understandable for somebody who has a loved one murdered, feel a desire to to want to get revenge. I think that that's expected. But our response as a society shouldn't be uh, alienation. I, I feel good about you being a part of it, somebody who has you know, such a long track record. But this does feel like very uncharted, mm -hmm. uncharted territory. California has done a very few victim offender dialogues in the history of our justice system. Fewer than 20. Wow. So yes, uncharted territory.
I'm scared, I'm nervous, you know. Um, I am meeting someone who killed another person. I am going to be feet away from a man who took another person's life. What if he hasn't changed? What if he is still a violent person? I most want to tell Mariah the truth. It's as simple as that. That's what's necessary, that's what's needed. When he looks at her, he may well see the face of the person he killed. We don't know how that's gonna impact him. When she starts asking questions, she may get answers she likes, or she may hear something. She goes, my God, that's what happened to my mother? And all this sweetness and light may just go away. We have no idea what's going to happen. When I got your letter, did not recognize the name, the address, anything. And by the first paragraph, it, it, it was it was like getting kicked in the chest. Um, that letter I felt I didn't deserve. I I deserve whatever it is you have to say about me. I didn't have a mom to teach me right from wrong. I had a father who taught me what not to do in life. And so the reason I'm doing this is because I have three children who look up to me. And a year ago, they almost lost me. My son, my oldest, was five. And my youngest was 15 months exactly how old my brother and I were when my mom was killed. I was given an opportunity to live the life that she didn't get to live. Do you remember a lot about my mom? I was told that you were her brother's friend. Uh, we went to school together. We had fell off years later, but... Uh, I, I, I remember your mom. We crossed paths a lot at different drug houses, similar circles and stuff like that. I had some uh, meth on me. She said she knew well, where she could go f make a quick flip. And so I gave her $40 worth of meth. And uh, she was supposed to go do this quick flip. And I didn't see her again. I didn't know that. So my question to you is, what really happened? I came across Charlene late at night. And she was sleeping in her car. I banged on the door, right there on the car window door. Um, and I had woken her up and instigated and escalated. As soon as she opened the door, I was like, where the hell is my money? Uh, you, you stupid, you know, and she went on the defensive and, and started arguing back. I just got more pissed off over a petty, small amount of money. And at that point in my life, I was a person who did not care about anybody else. I was only worried about me. I was only worried about feeding my addiction, and I was walking around pissed off at the world all the time. How, how did she die? <sighs> did she fight back? Did she ask you to stop? Did she ask for mercy? I 
told myself when this started that whatever you needed this is what you need I pulled out my knife and I stabbed her with with everything I had with years of built up anger and hatred and everything else it was violent and brutal she collapsed almost instantly she struggled some She suffered some. And I'm doing this because I told myself that I would do this. She suffered some. She was, she lost conscience after a moment. It wasn't a long drawn out thing. I can tell you that and I can tell you that with complete honesty. I heard her last breath. That's the thing that's going to stick with me the longest. That will never go away. And that's when I realized the magnitude of what I had done. Did she say anything? Did she mention my brother or I? It was a short struggle. And it was, why stop? It was a moment. From what I was told, you turned yourself in? No. They found you? They found me. When I was arrested, I gave a full confession okay. to everything. When I went to court, I pled guilty. I never denied it, but I did not turn myself in, no. How do you feel about what you did? How do you feel about what you did? I am the only person responsible and the only person to blame for those events. And for a long time, I did not think like that. I blamed her. I blamed the DA. I blamed the cops for a long time. And it wasn't until I finally looked at myself and where I was at. I owe, I owe a debt that cannot be repaid. But I'm going to spend the rest of my life repaying that. That's my motivating factor. And she's my motivating factor too. She's here with us, and she will always be with you. You will always have to carry her with you. You know, we have a bond that not a lot of people can say that they have. You did something terrible a long time ago, but that's not who you are anymore. And I wouldn't be sitting across from you if I truly didn't feel that way. And I know that you are changing the direction that your life is going in. was supposed to go the other way around. <laughs> it's okay. Uh -huh. Pay me back by helping other people. Make sure that another teenage kid does not end up where you ended up. If there's ever an extraordinary conversation ever had between two people, uh, that was it. What Mariah and Jason were able to do in that meeting 
was really inspiring. Their dialogue may have ended, but as it turns out, their story is not over. So I'm driving out to Lancaster Prison to meet with Mariah and Jason. Uh, I haven't seen them for more than a year. Did not expect to be seeing them in a prison. Uh, that's for sure. guys haven't seen each other for about a year. Mm -hmm. uh, so how are you feeling about seeing him now? My whole outlook on life changed after the dialogue with Jason. As hard as it was to hear about the, you know, final moments of my mother's life, it was honestly kind of a relief. In my mind, Jason was this person who, you know, attacked my mother at an ATM machine. And when he told me what happened, it made me see him in a different light, in a different perspective. I did have this really picture-perfect image of who she was and who she, you know, should have been. But, you know, Jason told me that the reason they had met was because she was getting drugs from him. But it didn't make me think any less of her. It just made me have a desire to change the way society deals with addictions. Maybe we could have prevented all of this. I'm living in Watts. It's a neighborhood in Los Angeles, South Central. I have my own room with a shared bathroom. I'm living it literally paycheck to paycheck. On the verge of being homeless, uh, you know, one bad one bad month and it's a wash. It's that adjustment back to society. I had set some goals for myself getting out and I had all these plans and what I was going to do and reality eventually sets in and you realize you can only do so much. It's been one thing after another but that's what life is, is that constant struggle, that constant moving forward and taking care of everything that needs to be taken care of. I work at the homeless outreach program in the re-entry department. If this is one little episode that may throw you down here and struggle. Yeah, it is. The addiction is real, man. It's real. Reach out to me when you get a chance, all right? For real. All right, cool. Uh, got help the them find employment, which is a, a really huge stabilizing factor when people are coming out. Wayne, you ready? People I'm working with are essentially where I was at a year and a half ago. What are you looking for right now, Wayne? Income. Housing and income. It took me four and a half months just to get my birth certificate. Uh, so having people assist you and get that stuff started is a big, huge step. So there it is, man. Yeah. Does it uh, look familiar? Not from the outside. Not from um, the outside. I've <laughs> only seen the outside of it one time, right? <laughs> yeah. And I'm wondering if you've given any thought to how this is going to affect you walking back into prison. You know, palms are a little damp. <laughs> It's starting to feel Slightly elevated uh, heart rate, but uh, yeah. like I said, I'm, I'm coming here under different circumstances. Not a uh, scared, uh, scared kid walking into the prison this time. You got your IDs? <gasps> what? Oh my goodness! Look at you! Oh. I had to step up my game. Uh, How I guess are so. You? I lived up. Oh, it's so nice to see you. Man, it's good to see you. See I've too. talked about you guys so many times. I mean, that was such a powerful experience for me. Um, you made me a promise. Yeah. You promised me you would never go back. Right. Well, um, <laughs> broke your promise. I, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that was. Yeah, there was that, and there was also um, uh, my impact on other people's lives too. So, uh, along with the, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing now. What, what's going to happen here today? What's going to happen here in this prison? So we're going to meet with uh, some men who have been participating in the victim awareness program. Everybody you're going to meet right now is a lifer. You know, I, I've been doing this for 30 years, and, and I don't think that this has ever happened, where there was a victim offender dialogue, and uh, both people have come back into a prison. Well, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to meeting these guys. I'm looking and, forward to meeting you, man. Yeah, so that should be good.
Jason, how, how does it feel? I mean, I'm just wondering what you're uh, going through. Uh, a little, a little surreal. I know it's still going to take me some time to fully adjust out of that prison mentality. When I left prison, it was like, don't look back. I didn't want to look back. And you turn your head. I just looked forward the whole time. It's not too heavy yet. incarcerated for 19 years. I've been incarcerated 27 years. I was convicted at the age of 17 to 50 years of life. At 19, I was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. I've been incarcerated since the age of 15. 30 years on a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. I did uh, 23 and a half years on a 15 to life. Uh, I paroled about a year and a half ago on November 8th, Election Day. And here I am back. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Today we're very fortunate because we have Jason and Mariah who have connected on a very deep level in spite of the fact that uh, society gives them messages that they should never cross paths. I know that the guys have a lot of questions about the actual victim offender dialogue. The dialogue was the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. I believe that right now it was. and. Uh, it was also one of the best things I've ever done. Yeah. Or the best thing, really, when I look back on my life. It's yeah. not a lot of good in there, but no, the best thing I've done and the most difficult thing I've ever been through. I thought I knew victims' awareness. I thought I knew victims' right. I didn't know shit. It was not until this did I actually have a, an understanding that there's a whole other side to the story that we can't even grasp or, or wrap our heads around because we, in here we don't have that, that connection with the people. We don't have that understanding. I went in there with the attitude um, that I was going to do this uh, for Mariah and so that hopefully she could get what she needed out of it. And the uh, side effect of that was I got, uh, I, I think, just as much out of that the most difficult part was that that face-to-face -face brutal honesty like that because you didn't cut me any slack. You no. asked me all the hard questions. Hearing from him over the phone or receiving a letter probably wouldn't have done anything for me. I need to physically see the remorse and physically see him uncomfortable telling me what he did. I came out of there um, completely changed. That heaviness that lays on your heart for having uh, lived the life I did and, and done the things I had done, being able to lay everything on the table and, and get that really off my chest. That's where my healing came from. I noticed that when you were sharing, some of you got very teary-eyed. Why is that? When I see him, I see myself. He walked in my shoes. He walked the same yards I walked. And he's free. But not only is he free physically. Oh, speak. He's free spiritually in his heart. And that's what you gave him. Well, I, I know for me, like, that's what this is all about. It's about that type of connection with people in a way that heals them, too. My greatest fear is facing my, my survivors. You know, it's like, how do you talk to somebody that you took their son? I mean, it just, you can't replace it. When you actually have the blessing of having a survivor come to you, that's, that's, something, that, that's something that we all dream of. What would you want to say? I would want to, to the best of my ability, explain how I have at least some understanding of the impact, the negative impact that I've had when I murdered my wife. It was one person. However, 
everyone that she knew and everyone she was connected with, her friends, her co-workers, her family, of course, my family. All of these people are affected. My daughter has never known her, her mom. I took all that away. It sounds cliche, but the only thing we have is to be able to say I'm sorry. That's all we have. You said it was cliche to say I'm sorry, but I want you to know something. This man is the only person who has victimized me that has ever said I'm sorry. I can't look at you guys and promise you that if you do this work, that all of your victims and all of your survivors are going to say, you know what, I forgive you, it's okay. And you need to be able to recognize and acknowledge that because if you can't, you are never going to fully heal. Uh, the work that you're doing is work that should be happening at all levels of society. The reality is that it's not. I work in Washington, D.C., and I see psychotic behavior all over the place with people with a lot more power than anybody in this room and um, no real accountability. And so uh, don't underestimate the power of taking accountability, taking responsibility, and healing because you have no idea where it goes.